Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. I'm Linda Zavrilli. I'm a faculty member at the Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality and the Department of Political Science. Um, continuing productive collaborations from past years, today's lecture is one of several upcoming joint events between the center and the law school on questions of sexual freedom, reproductive justice, and women's equal citizenship in a post-Roe world. Before introducing our guest speaker, Professor Jeff Stone, I want to thank several people who were involved in facilitating this event. At the law school, many thanks to Dean Thomas Miles and Dean of Students Charles Todd at the Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality. Special thanks to Director Kristen Schilt, who generously supported this initiative. Thanks to the Executive Director Gina Olson, Assistant Director for Student Affairs and Curriculum Bonnie Cantor, and Assistant Director for Programming and Operations Tate Braza. Special thanks to Helen Galvin Ross, a PhD student in political and feminist theory at Chicago, who is working with me on this and related post-row programming at the center. It is a great pleasure and honor to introduce Jeff Stone, who's the Edward H. Levy Distinguished Service Professor of Law. Professor Stone joined the Chicago faculty in 1973. He served as a law clerk to Supreme Court Justice William Brennan Jr. when Roe was decided. Among other distinguished positions held, he served as provost to the university from 1993 to 2002 and dean of the law school from 1987 through 1993. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and a member of the American Law Institute, the National Advisory Council, the American Civil Liberties Union, and the American Philosophical Society. He's written amicus briefs for constitutional scholars in key Supreme Court cases relevant to our topic today, including Obergefell, Whole Women's Health, and Lawrence. I should also add that Professor Stone has been a loyal friend to the Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality, supporting many of its initiatives concerning gender equality and sexual freedom, for which we thank him. A truly prolific and field-shaping scholar, Professor Stone is the author, co-author, and editor of over 22 books and dozens of articles on constitutional law with a focus on the First Amendment and the perennial dangers to freedom and equal citizenship in liberal democratic societies. He's an editor of the Supreme Court Review and the chief editor of a 25-volume series on constitutional law titled Inalienable Rights, published by Oxford University Press. He's also editing an exciting new book on abortion and the Dobbs decision with Lee Bollinger, president of Columbia University, which should be out this spring. Allow me to dwell for just a moment on one of his many books, the 2017 Sex and the Constitution, Sex, Religion, and Law from America's Origins to the 20th Century. This 600 plus page tour de force should be required reading for anyone trying to make sense of how we got to Dobbs and the consequences of that decision for gender equality, sexual freedom, and American democracy. The prologue begins thus. We are in the midst of a constitutional revolution. It's a revolution that tests the most fundamental values of the American people and that has shaken constitutional law to its roots. It has bitterly divided citizens, politicians, and judges. It is a battle that has dominated politics, inflamed religious passions, and challenged Americans to rethink and re-examine their positions on issues they once thought settled. It is a story that has never been told in its full sweep. And best of all, it is about sex. With this teaser, Professor Stone begins a stunningly comprehensive and rich narrative about how matters of sex ranging from contraception and abortion to pornography and sodomy became the topics of constitutional law. His fascinating history of abortion explains why it is far more complicated than people realize, showing in detail how government regulation of abortion law has been connected to the nation's complex religious history. Professor Stone exposes as false many commonly held views, such as the idea that abortion 
has always, had always been illegal and criminalized. On the contrary, at the time the Constitution was adopted, it was legal in every state, and what is more, it was fairly common. Drawing on the second wave women's movement, which he rightly credits for bringing to light those alternative stories of the past, Professor Stone goes on to show that the past, when critically interpreted, can become part of new public stories that alter how we think about our present. His account challenges the idea that the turn to the past to answer questions posed by the present is inherently regressive, especially when it comes to constitutional history. I imagine that we shall get a sense of this fascinating history and the novel public stories that can come from it today. Please join me in welcoming Professor Jeff Stone. Thank you, Linda. That's the longest introduction I've ever had. Um, so I'm delighted to see you all here. Um, I also, by the way, take particular pride in the Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality, because when I was provost of the university, um, I helped to create the center. Um, so I am particularly pleased to have this be a joint event between the law school and the center. Um, so for the past half century, one of the most contentious and bitterly divisive issues in American politics has been the Supreme Court's 1973 decision in Roe versus Wade. Opponents of Roe have insisted that the court invented a constitutional right out of whole cloth without any legitimate justification. Supporters of Roe maintain that it was a perfectly sound decision that correctly recognized a fundamental constitutional right of women. Now, whether one agrees or disagrees with Roe or with the court's recent decision in Dobbs that, of course, overruled it, contemporary understandings of the decision in Roe and of its historical origins are often confused and incomplete. The story of how we got to Roe v. Wade, like the story of how we got to Brown v. Board of Education, is important to remember, for it gives us both content and context to the debates of the present. So let us begin at the beginning. And here I'm repeating a little bit of what Linda already said. <clears throat> at the time that our Constitution was adopted, abortion was often relied upon by women to avoid the consequences of unwanted births. In that era, contrary to what many people today assume, abortion before quickening, that is, the, before the point at which a woman could feel movement, roughly at four and a half months, was perfectly legal. Indeed, this had been the state of the law at least as far back as the ancient Greeks, through the Romans, through the Middle Ages, and so on. Although the church in the Middle Ages condemned abortion as a sin, the law did not treat abortion as a crime. To the contrary, those who did not share the faith were free to do as they wished. Abortion was also common and illegal in England in the years leading up to the American Revolution. As Lady Caroline Fox wrote her husband in the 1740s upon learning that she was pregnant, for the third time in as many years, quote, I'm certainly breathing. I took a great deal of physic yesterday in hopes to send it away. Soon thereafter, she wrote her husband that she had been successful, noting is not that clever. At this time, a wide variety of, quote, female pills were readily available in London shops for the purpose of inducing abortion. The American colonies embraced the same approach to abortion as the English common law. An abortion before quickening was both common and legal. And indeed, even abortion after quickening was almost never punished. Over the course of the 19th century, abortion became ever more common. This was evident in the fact that the birth rate in the United States fell dramatically from 1800 to 1900. In the colonial era, the average family had nine children. By 1900, that number was only three. The reason for this change was clear. In the agrarian world of the 18th century, children were an important economic asset. 
But by the end of the 19th century, with greater urbanization, children were increasingly seen as a financial burden that could cause a family's economic ruin. Thus, for most families, birth control had become essential. And because contraception was generally unreliable, abortion was seen as a critical way of managing family size. Indeed, by the middle of the 19th century, approximately 20% of all pregnancies ended in abortion. At this time, abortifacients were readily available from mail order firms and pharmacists. Daily newspapers regularly ran ads for abortifacients, and those who provided abortion services did so quite openly. The flamboyant Anne Lohman Restel of New York, for example, who is popularly known as Madame Restel, maintained a highly profitable abortion business, serving a genteel middle and upper class clientele. She touted, quote, her celebrated powers for married ladies. And like many of her competitors, she broadly advertised her services in the press of the day. To give you a sense of the times, here's an example of one of her widely distributed advertisements. Quote, the married women, is it but too well known that the families of the married often increase beyond what the happiness of those who give them birth would dictate? In how many instances does the hardworking father, and more especially the mother, of a poor family remain slaves throughout their lives, urging at the, urging at the oar of incessant labor, toiling to live, living but to toil? Is it desirable, then, for parents to increase their families, regardless of the consequences to themselves or the well-being of their offspring, when a simple, easy, healthy, and certain remedy is within our control? End quote. Now, the general acceptance of abortion as an appropriate method of managing family size began to change during the 19th century. Two factors in particular contributed to this radical change. First, religious perspectives on abortion began to shift during the evangelical explosion of the Second Great Awakening. The traditional Protestant conception of the fetus assumed that it was not alive until the point of quickening. Abandoning that view, aggressive evangelicals during the Second Great Awakening began to preach that a separate, distinct, and precious life came into being at the very moment of conception. Second, medical professionals in this era increasingly came to the view, based partly on religion and partly on half-baked science, that human life begins at conception. A professor at the University of Pennsylvania Medical School, for example, published a pamphlet in which he confidently asserted that the newly conceived embryo could think and could perceive right and wrong. And in the 1850s, the Boston doctor and religious moralist Horatio Storer initiated a concerted physician's crusade against abortion. Storer decried the growing frequency of abortion and maintained that the primary cause of this phenomenon was the, quote, general demoralization of women and widespread ignorance of the true character of abortion. Storer insisted that many women who have an abortion, quote, become confirmed invalids and develop serious and often fatal organic disease. He added that some women who have an abortion die either immediately or shortly thereafter as a result of, quote, moral shock from the very thought of what they have done, while many others were driven to insanity. Storer charged that children born to a woman after she has had an abortion are often deformed and diseased, and that they, they too therefore bear the burden of their mother's heinous act. Storer emphatically rejected the notion that a woman should decide this question for herself, because he explained during pregnancy, a woman's mind is prone to derangement. As a result of Storer's campaign, in 1859, the newly founded American Medical Association adopted a resolution condemning abortion at every stage of gestation, except when necessary to save the life of the woman. Over the next several decades, the AMA, working hand in hand with religious moralists during the late 19th century, um, launched an aggressive and successful campaign to rid the nation not only of abortion, but of all contraception as well. As the leading voice of this movement explained, the sole purpose of women is to produce children, 
and women must therefore remain within their God-given sphere. By the end of the 19th century, in a complete reversal of the world of the framers, every state had enacted legislation prohibiting the distribution of any product for the purpose of contraception, and every state had enacted legislation prohibiting abortion at any stage of pregnancy, unless a doctor certified that the abortion was necessary to save the life of the woman. Thus, for the first time in Western history, abortion was unlawful even before quickening, and women who sought abortions were now themselves subject to criminal prosecution. Opponents of birth control insisted that the issue was simple. Quote, if a woman didn't want to get pregnant, then she shouldn't do anything that might get her pregnant. It was as simple as that. But despite the threat of criminal sanctions, the medical professions often perverse warnings about the dangers of abortion and the preaching of religious moralists. Women in the late 19th century continued to seek abortion in record numbers. Indeed, by the turn of the 20th century, approximately 2 million women had illegal abortions each year, and almost a third of all pregnancies ended in abortion. Now, though, for the first time in history, these abortions had to be performed illegally, in secret and unsafe circumstances, and by much less reliable practitioners than in the past. Moving ahead, by the 1950s, with improvements in contraception, which was now increasingly, but not universally legal in the United States, the number of unwanted pregnancies gradually declined. But even then, approximately one million women each year resorted to illegal abortions. The vast majority of these women continued to turn either to self-induced abortion or to the dark and often forbidding world of back alley abortions. Women who resorted to self-induced abortion typically relied on such methods as throwing themselves down a flight of stairs or ingesting, douching with, or inserting into themselves a chilling variety of chemicals and toxins ranging from bleach to turpentine to gunpowder. Knitting needles, crochet hooks, scissors, and coat hangers were among the tools most commonly used by women who attempted to self-abort. Approximately 30% of all illegal abortions at this time were self-induced. Women who sought abortions from back alley abortionists encountered similar horrors. To find someone to perform an illegal abortion, which was illegal, women often had to rely on tips from elevator operators, taxi cab drivers, salesmen, and the like. To find someone to perform an illegal abortion was itself dangerous, and because of the clandestine nature of illegal abortions, the very process of finding an abortionist was dangerous and often terrifying. Women who sought back alley abortions were often blindfolded, taken to remote areas, and passed off to people they did not know and could not even see during the entire process. Such abortions were performed not only in secret offices and hotel rooms, but also in dank bathrooms, in the back seats of cars, and literally in back alleys. The vast majority of these abortions were performed either by persons with limited medical training or by rank amateurs, including elevator operators, prostitutes, barbers, and unskilled laborers. In addition to those who died in the course of illegal abortions, many thousands more suffered serious illness or injury. The stories of women who suffered through this nightmare are legion. One woman recalled how a fellow college student who had had an illegal abortion was too frightened to tell anyone what she had done. She locked herself in the bathroom in her dormitory and quietly bled to death. In another instance, 28-year-old Geraldine Santoro bled to death on the floor of the Connecticut hotel room after she and her former lover attempted an abortion on their own. The former lover, who had no medical experience, used a textbook and some borrowed tools. When things went terribly wrong, he fled the scene, and Santoro died alone. So against this background, I want to tell you a little story that's quite fascinating about the University of Chicago. In the late 1960s, what I just described was still the law in Illinois and in almost all states in the nation. A student in the college named Heather Booth had a friend very secretly say to her that she was pregnant and wondered if Heather 
could find someone who could help to perform this abortion. Heather, who was and still is a very energetic and courageous person, found a doctor on the south side of Chicago who safely performed the abortion for the other student. But recognizing what this, what this reality was like, um, Heather decided to create an organization called Jane. In Jane, college students at the university were taught how to perform safe abortions by the original doctor who Heather had brought to her attention. Over the next several years, a hundred individuals, most of them students in the college, performed 11,000 abortions for women on the South Side, all of which were illegal and all of which, if the women performing the abortions were caught, could put them in jail for years. But they nonetheless had the courage to do this. Indeed, right before the decision in Roe, Heather and many other women in Jane were arrested by the police for performing illegal abortions. After Roe came down, however, the police decided to drop the charges against them, even though what they had done at the time was illegal. By the way, there are a number of movies that relate the history of the organization Jane uh, that are available online. And um, if you are interested, you should try to find them because they're quite fascinating. In any event, as I noted earlier, the occasional visibility of such incidents led some religious organizations that had previously been silent on the issue of abortion to address the issue more directly. Protestant churches varied in their opinions. The United Methodist Church, for example, acknowledged, quote, the sanctity of onborn human life, but nonetheless proclaimed that because, quote, we are equally bound to respect the sacredness of the life and well-being of the woman, for whom devastating damage may result from an unacceptable pregnancy, we support the removal of abortion from the criminal code. Similarly, in 1968, the American Baptist Convention came to the conclusion that abortion should be a matter of responsible personal decision. At roughly the same time, the rising voice of the women's movement began to shape public discourse on the issue of abortion. In February of 1969, for example, Betty Friedan, the founding president of the National Organization for Women, delivered a rousing address in Chicago in what was billed as the first national conference on abortion laws. Friedan declared that, quote, there is no freedom no equality possible for women until we assert and demand the control over our own bodies, over our own reproductive process. At the end of the conference, the participants founded the National Association for Repeal of Abortion Laws, NARAL, on the premise that what was needed was a complete overhaul of America's abortion laws. Recognizing, quote, the basic human right of a woman to control her own reproduction, Nehral declared that it was dedicated to the elimination of all laws that would compel a woman to bear a child against her will. Later that year, Planned Parenthood and the American Public Health Association also called for repeal of America's abortion laws and declared abortion to be a fundamental personal right of a woman. As these organizations moved to the forefront of national debate, the law gradually began to change. In 1970, four states, Hawaii, Alaska, Washington, and New York, legalized abortion in the first trimester, thus restoring the law to more or less what it had been at the time that our Constitution was adopted. Opponents of these laws quickly mobilized their forces, and adding fuel to the fire, in 1972, Congress approved the Equal Rights Amendment and submitted it to the states for ratification. This immediately led religious and conservative activists to tie the issue of abortion to even larger conflicts about the appropriate role of women in American society and to the meaning of so-called family values. Suddenly, the legislative process, the progress on abortion that had begun only a few years earlier, ground to a halt. Despite growing and clear majority support for legalizing abortion, no state legislature now acted on this view. 
Several factors contributed to this legislative paralysis. The most important was that the initial round of pro-abortion legislative victories energized abortion opponents, and they organized with extraordinary effectiveness. Those opposed to abortion threatened to act as single-issue voters, and they communicated that intention to elected officials with perfect clarity. Legislators knew all too well that although a substantial majority of voters supported legalizing abortion, when the election day rolled around, committed single-issue voters who were passionate about their position could effectively vote them out of office. Faced with this sudden paralysis in the legislative arena, pro-choice advocates began for the first time to think about challenging the constitutionality of anti-abortion laws in the courts. Initially, this seemed a long shot, because in the words of New York Times columnist Linda Greenhouse, the idea of a constitutional right of abortion seemed uncertain. But with legislative change effectively blocked, the courts now seemed the only realistic alternative. In 1970, after the Connecticut legislature repeatedly refused to amend its 19th century anti-abortion statute, a group of women activists formed a new organization, Women versus Connecticut, to challenge the constitutionality of the state law. Quote, we want control over our own bodies. We are tired of being pressured to have children or not to have children. It's our decision. Six weeks after Women vs. Connecticut filed this complaint in federal court on behalf of 858 women plaintiffs, the federal court held the Connecticut law unconstitutional. Judge Edward Lombard, a conservative Eisenhower appointee, held that in this law, Connecticut trespasses unjustifiably on the personal privacy and liberty of its female citizens in violation of the Constitution and that the state's purported interest in banning abortion are insufficient to take from the woman the decision that she, as the appropriate decision maker, must be free to choose. Cases challenging anti-abortion laws now started popping up everywhere. In Georgia, for example, a group of 24 plaintiffs, including doctors, nurses, social workers, and members of the clergy, challenged the constitutionality of Georgia's anti-abortion statute. The federal court in Georgia also held the statute unconstitutional, explaining that the constitutional quite, uh, quote, concept of personal liberty embodies a right to individual privacy that is broad enough to include the decision to terminate an unwanted pregnancy. At roughly the same time in Texas, Linda Coffey and Sarah Weddington, two recent graduates of the University of Texas Law School, teamed up with a plaintiff identified only as Jane Roe to challenge the Texas anti-abortion statute. On June 17, 1970, the federal court in Texas held that the Texas law violated the fundamental right of women to decide for themselves whether or not to have children. A year later, the Supreme Court of the United States announced that it would hear the case of Roe versus Wade. Now, many Americans today think of Roe versus Wade as a radical left-wing decision, but that was not at all the view at the time. By 1973, a substantial majority of Americans supported the right of a woman to terminate an unwanted pregnancy, and Gallup polls showed that two out of three Americans think abortion should be a matter for decision solely between a woman and her physician. Moreover, as we've seen, the lower courts were already moving sharply in a direction that anticipated the decision in Roe. Although the Constitution does not expressly mention a right to abortion, the Supreme Court had long understood that the framers of our Constitution did not intend to limit the rights of Americans to only those rights that are expressly guaranteed in the Constitution, like the freedom of speech, the freedom from unreasonable searches and seizures, and the right not to be deprived of life or liberty without due process of law. Indeed, the framers clearly understood that those terms were vague and that over time the Supreme Court would have to give them meaning. Moreover, there were other provisions of the Constitution that were clearly understood to protect rights that were not explicitly guaranteed in the Constitution. The Ninth Amendment, for example, states expressly that, quote, the enumeration of certain rights in the Constitution shall not be construed to deny or disparage other rights retained by the people. Against this background, the court had often recognized constitutional rights that were not expressly mentioned in the Constitution, including, for example, the right not to be sterilized, the right to use contraceptives, 
the right to travel across state lines, the right to marry, and the right to raise one's own children. In an overwhelming 7-2 decision, the Supreme Court in Roe held that the Constitution did indeed guarantee a woman's right to decide for herself whether or not to bear a child. Strikingly, five of the six justices appointed by Republican presidents, including three of the four appointed just a few years earlier by Richard Nixon, who opposed abortion, joined the decision. Indeed, without their support, Roe would have come out the other way that Warren Berger, Harry Blackman, and Lewis Powell joined Justices Douglas, Brennan, Stewart, and Marshall in Roe speaks volumes about the mainstream nature of the decision. Now, one interesting question is what led the justices to reach the decision that they did in Roe. And again, because I was there at the time, I can state with some degree of confidence what, in fact, led the justices to do this thing. First, there were there are really two factors in particular. First, at the time that Roe was decided, it was widely understood that abortion had been illegal and criminal from time immemorial, that it was never legal to have an abortion. If you asked Americans that question, I would guess 90% of them would say, of course, there was never, it was never legal to have an abortion, because that's what the conservatives and the religious moralists had repeated over and over and over again for decades. What the justices came to understand, and it surprised them, was that that was simply false. That freedom of a woman to have an abortion had been recognized from the ancient world all the way up until the mid-19th century, including in America at the time the Constitution was adopted. That was simply stunning because it was just not part of the public knowledge at all. The second thing they learned, which was clearly a motivation for them, was about the horror of illegal and back alley abortions. Because it was a crime to have those abortions, women did not tell anyone about it. And except when somebody died, there was no visibility of what the horrendous world of abortion was like at this time. But because of the women's movement, who encouraged women who had abortions to come out and talk about what their experiences were like, the justices came to understand two fundamental things. First, how horrendous it is for our society to put women in a position that they would undergo these awful circumstances. And second, it gave the justices an understanding of how critical it was for these women not to carry a pregnancy to term. They were willing to go through these nightmares in order to avoid that. It was not just a matter of convenience. It was a matter of necessity and a willingness to take great personal risks to have this done. So with that information newly visible, the justices, including, as I said, three of the four Nixon appointees, reached the conclusion that the court did in Roe. And the plain and simple fact is that at the time Roe was decided, the justices did not view the abortion issue as, po as posing a particularly ideological, partisan, or religious question. Although the justices certainly understood the stakes, none of them imagined that Roe would later come to be a central flashpoint of American politics. This understanding of Roe is consistent with both the news coverage and the public reaction at the time. The editorials and commentary about Roe were overwhelmingly approving. Even newspapers in traditionally conservative states took this view. The Atlanta Constitution, for example, characterized the decision as realistic and appropriate. The Houston Chronicle called it sound, and the San Antonio Light gushed that although in its view the ruling wasn't perfect, it was as close to it as humanly possible. Moreover, the American people clearly endorsed the decision. In polls taken at the time, more than 60% of Americans approved of the decision in Roe. To put that in perspective, it's useful to compare the public's reaction in Ro to Roe with its reaction to other, much more controversial decisions. In 1962, for example, after the Supreme Court held that prayer in public schools was unconstitutional, 79% of Americans 
disapproved of that decision. In 1967, after the court held that laws prohibiting interracial marriage were unconstitutional, 72% of Americans disapproved. And in 2010, after the court held that laws limiting corporate campaign expenditures were unconstitutional, 80% of Americans disapproved. But less than 40% of Americans disagreed with Roe. An additional measure of how uncontroversial Roe was at the time is the fact that when President Gerald Ford nominated John Paul Stevens to succeed Justice William O. Douglas in 1975, two years after Roe, not a single senator asked Stevens a question about Roe or about his views on abortion. It just wasn't seen as controversial at the time. Even most evangelicals did not challenge the decision. For in 1973, most evangelicals still regarded abortion as a Catholic issue. The one group that did strongly condemn Roe from the very moment of the decision were Catholics, who disapproved of the decision by a margin of 56 to 40 percent. Even that is not as overwhelming as one might have expected. Within days of the decision, thousands of telegrams and letters of protest from Catholics began pouring into the Supreme Court, many of them letters from Catholic school students denouncing the justices as murderers and butchers. The vast majority of these letters were addressed either to Justice Blackman, the author of the opinion, or to Justice Brennan, the court's only Catholic justice for whom I was clerking at the time. Now, the court wasn't used to getting this kind of response, and the hallways along the chambers of the justices became very quickly filled with boxes going from the floor to the ceiling along the whole hallways. Now, the justices had no interest in reading this stuff. And the only people who were willing to sit there at 2 in the morning, opening up these boxes and going through the endless mail, were the law clerks who had interviewed for jobs and were looking for their reimbursement checks for their travel. <laughs> this is true. Now, of course, as we know, Roe eventually emerged into a bitterly divisive issue. But this didn't happen until the end of the decade, as the culture wars exploded over such issues as the Equal Rights Amendment, gay rights, sexual expression, and women's liberation, thus inflaming the evangelical community because of the threats those issues posed to their values, their religious values. By this time, polls showed that more than a third of all Americans identified themselves as born again. And evangelicals have become the nation's largest religious demographic. When the Reverend Jerry Falwell founded the Moral Majority in 1979, he brought together for the first time in American history the many disparate elements of Christian fundamentalism into a single unified political movement. Falwell explained that Roe had awakened him from his slumber. And he preached that if evangelicals worked together, they had the power, quote, to take control of the national government. The moral majority raised huge amounts of money to support political candidates. And in state after state, its members wrested control of the state Republican apparatus from the party regulars. By the summer of 1980, Republican Party leaders were treating Falwell more than any other religious figure in American history, like the leader of a powerful religious constituency. The Christian broadcaster Pat Robertson boasted that the evangelical community now had enough votes to run the country. And in its pursuit of the presidency, Ronald Reagan now called for a constitutional amendment to overturn Roe v. Wade and promised to appoint pro-life judges at all levels of the federal judiciary, thus ushering in a historic era of judicial nominations shaped in large part by religious conceptions of constitutional law. With Reagan's election, James Dobson, the founder of Focus on the Family, proclaimed that evangelicals had finally come home, and that home was the White House. In the years since 1980, a succession of Republican presidents have sought religiously to support, to appoint, Supreme Court justices who would vote to overturn Roe v. Wade. Interestingly, though, several of those justices, especially John Paul Stevens, Sandra Day O'Connor, Anthony Kennedy, and David Souter, disappointed those who had appointed them demonstrating both a respect for precedent and an understanding of the fundamental right at issue in Roe, Stevens, O'Connor, Kennedy, and Souter consistently reaffirmed 
the core premises of Roe v. Wade, despite repeated efforts to overturn the decision. Having learned this lesson, though, Republican presidents from Reagan to Trump grew ever more determined not to replicate this mistake. And with Republican appointments of such justices as Clarence Thomas, John Roberts, Samuel Alito, Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett, all of whom, by the way, were raised Catholic, and all of whom were chosen in no small part because of their deeply embedded anti-abortion views, which were known. Anti-abortionists finally achieved their goal in Dobbs of overruling Roe v. Wade. Now, in the United States, before the decision in Dobbs, 30% of all women had at least one legal abortion, one legal abortion, during their lives. And approximately 650,000 women had legal abortions annually. Roe played a critical role in giving women control over their own bodies and their destiny, it was deeply grounded in the understanding that we must have the right to make fundamental decisions about our own lives and our own families. Roe enabled women to chart their own futures and to control their own bodies. It is a long-standing observation that if men could get pregnant, you could be sure that abortion would be safe and legal. But with the court's decision in Dobbs, hundreds of thousands of women, mostly poor and minority, will once again be thrown each year into the dark and dangerous world of illegal abortion. So what was the reasoning of Justice Samuel Alito's 100-page opinion in the Dobbs case? The first challenge he confronted is the doctrine of stare decisis. Under that doctrine, courts must respect and not overrule prior decisions, except in extraordinary circumstances. There are several reasons for this policy. First, the law should be stable and predictable. If courts could routinely overrule precedents that the current justices disagreed with, then the law would be a mess. It would be unstable and unpredictable. Second, we don't want justices to be appointed for the purpose of overruling prior decisions that a particular party doesn't like. That would over-politicize the appointment process, create uncertainty and confusion, and politicize the court in a way that would seriously undermine its credibility as a legal rather than a political entity. Because of these concerns, justices rarely overrule precedents, even if the current justices disagree with them, except in extraordinary circumstances. Usually, justices overrule precedents not because they disagree with them, but because things have changed significantly since they were decided, and they no longer achieve the goals that they were meant to achieve. A good example of this is Brown versus Board of Education, which overruled the court's decision in Plessy v. Ferguson, which was decided some 60 years earlier. The court reached this result because experience had taught that racial segregation in schools is not neutral, and that it has a significant and discriminatory effect on blacks. Interesting, interestingly, in almost every prior decision in which the court overrules a prior decision involving individual freedom, it has done so, as in Brown, in order to expand rather than to contract the rights of Americans. Now, because none of these factors was even remotely present at the time of the court's decision in Dobbs, in order legitimately to overrule Roe, Justice Alito would have to present compelling evidence that the decision in Roe was profoundly and fundamentally wrong. In order to make his case, Alito argued that Roe was fundamentally wrong because at the time that the 14th Amendment was adopted in 1868, a majority of states, for the reasons I said out earlier, had by then made abortion a crime. Thus, applying an originalist view, Alito insisted that Roe was wrong because those who adopted the 14th Amendment did not affirmatively intend to hold laws restricting abortion unconstitutional. And that clearly seems correct. The framers of the 14th Amendment were not thinking about abortion in 1868. And if asked, they surely would not have said that they affirmatively intended the 14th Amendment to make laws prohibiting abortion unconstitutional. It just wasn't the issue before them at the time. The question then is whether that is a correct way to interpret the Constitution. The problem with this approach, which was invented by Antonin Scalia and Robert Bork in the late 1970s, 
is that it is artificial and ironically clearly inconsistent with the overall intentions and understandings of those who adopted these very provisions. What the framers were doing was not freezing the meaning of these intentionally vague and open-ended provisions of the Constitution, but they were adopting principles that needed to be interpreted and applied over the course of centuries. In applying those principles, courts should try to fulfill the aspirations of the relevant provisions, but not limit their meaning to what the framers of themselves specifically understood them to mean at the time. Let me give you a few examples. At the time the Equal Protection Clause was adopted, none of the framers thought it had anything to do with women. At that time, women could not be lawyers, they could not be doctors, they could not be policemen, they could not be judges, they could not serve on juries, and on and on and on. Over time, the court came to understand that the fundamental principle of equal protection of the laws was not bound by the original understanding of the framers, but by the principle of equality itself. Now, I could give a hundred similar examples. Think of interracial marriage, separate but equal, the right to contraception, same-sex marriage, the right of poor criminal defendants to be provided with counsel, the conclusion that wiretapping is a search within the meaning of the Fourth Amendment, and on and on and on. Those are all inconsistent with the actual affirmative understanding of the framers of the relevant provisions. Now, although Alito's originalist view seems critical, credible to some very conservative lawyers and judges, it has never carried the day in the Supreme Court or in the profession of the law. The problem with originalism is that it is not originalist. It embraces an approach to constitutional interpretation that the framers themselves never intended or even imagined. But that is the core of Alita's argument. He goes on and on to berate Justice Harry Blackmun for writing the opinion in Roe, as well as the other six justices who joined his opinion. In the end, though, Alita's opinion and the court's decision is not based on any principled approach to either stare decisis or to constitutional law. It is instead a personally driven decision designed to further the political and religious views of the justices in the majority. Denying American women the freedom recognized in Roe will do serious damage to the lives of many of those women and their families. But who cares? They're just women, after all. I'd like to make one final point. From 1973 to the present, among the justices not on the court at the time Dobbs was decided, nine Republican-appointed justices supported the decision in Roe, and only two of them opposed that decision, Rehnquist and Scalia. In the current court, Clarence Thomas, Samuel Alito, Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, Amy Coney Barrett, all voted to overrule Roe. That is the product not of law, but of aggressive and illegitimate politics determining the makeup of our Supreme Court. Thank you. You focused a lot on the evangelical push uh, and the push back, like the backlash against abortion. But I wanted to know what do you think was the influence of uh, other conservative pushback, particularly Philly Schlafly and the Schlafly Eagles, thinking about the relation between the equal right, the failed equal rights amendment, and the abortion debate? Because I think that's also a really important part of the story. And I was wondering, like. You know, do you think that was relevant or, or not? Like, how do you uh, make sense of that in this convoluted issue? So at the time Roe was decided, which was shortly after the Equal Rights Amendment had been put forward by Congress, uh, the justices all assumed that it would be enacted and that we were living in a moment in which the rights of women and the equality rights of women and the freedom of women was finally being recognized in an appropriate way. Ultimately, we know the ERA was not ratified. And there is a movement now to still attempt to do so. Um, but I think it's important to recognize that at that moment, the justices, even those appointed by Republican presidents, understood that our society was unjust and unfair to the status and standing of women in the United States. And that, that clearly, as I said, affected their understanding in this situation. Um, and <clears throat> I think the failure of the ERA was a, um, 
was the result <coughs> excuse me, of similar opposition to the opposition to Roe. The idea that this nation would not adopt an amendment that would expressly give women equal protection of the law is terrifying, frankly. Um, I should say the Supreme Court, as time went on, did begin to interpret the Equal Protection Clause to give women a substantial degree of protection through the Equal Protection Clause, um, even though the ERA was not ratified. Um, but I do think that the opposition to the ERA, we ask yourself, why did people oppose that? Who was it, right? It was the same people who opposed Roe v. Wade. Um, and in both cases now, they seem to have achieved their goals. Um, there have been a lot of different approaches that have been recommended for how to restore uh, women and um, pregnant people's rights to abortion. And I was wondering if you thought that a more prescriptive rule in the Constitution um, amending the Constitution with that being such a difficult process, amending state constitutions, elections, restructuring the Supreme Court. What do you think is the most achievable result, and what do you think is the best approach for the long term for women's rights? So the question is, what, what do I think is the best approach to trying to protect women's rights uh, with respect to abortion and otherwise? It is getting out the vote, plain and simple. This Supreme Court is going to be there for a long time. And they're not going to change their views. They are deeply embedded in the values that led to Dobbs and that will continue to lead to decisions going forward that are highly conservative and often religiously based. A number of decisions in the past year uh, gave extraordinary protection to religious freedom in a way that the Supreme Court had never given it before. So I don't think that these justices are going to change their mind, and they're not going to be, an, there's not going to be an opportunity for replacing them um, very soon. Hopefully in your lifetime, it would be possible. Uh, increase in the size of the court, I think, ain't going to happen because the Republicans in Congress would oppose it. And I also think, frankly, myself, it's not a great idea. Because even though it's in some sense warranted because of the way Republicans achieved the current majority through the efforts of, Merrick, of um, uh, Mitch McConnell by blocking Merrick Garland and then stuffing Amy Coney Barrett through the Senate with only a week or two before the 2020 presidential election, um, the fact is that if we add more justices to the court, it will seem to be, and it will be, a highly partisan effort, which would go even further to undermining the credibility of the court as an institution. If people really believe a larger court would be better, and I don't particularly believe that in the abstract, then I think the way to do that is to adopt a law to that effect, but that it, by its own terms does not go into effect for 25 years. So nobody voting for it knows which party is going to benefit from increasing the size of the court. But to increase the size of the court for partisan political reasons, uh, I just don't think it's not a way we want to go. The reputation of the court today is much lower than it's been in many decades. And if this were to happen, it would drop it even further. So as someone who believes we need a court, um, I, I think that the best way to deal with these issues is to elect representatives at the state and federal level who will adopt laws that protect the women's freedom, even though the Constitution won't be saying that, I suspect, for a very long time. So you should all get out the vote. Take that seriously. I mean, when I went to college and law school, it was during the Civil Rights Movement, it was during the Vietnam War, um, and uh, it was during the Women's Rights Movement, and law students were out there actively participating in the electoral process. And I think it's for those of you who believe that we're headed in the wrong direction in this country, it's essential that you do that. Even if it doesn't seem like much fun, and even if it's complicated, that's the best way to avoid even worse disasters in our society.
I was wondering if you could touch on whether or not you believe that Roe and the right to abortion being decided through the courts as an unelected body versus through Congress as an elected body contributed to the anti-abortion push and the culture wars that followed, as well as our current political climate surrounding abortion. So a fundamental question is why should the courts have the ability to override decisions of the democratic system? Why not just let the majority do what they want and you don't need courts there, right? The framers of our constitution understood that democracy was not perfect and that it was flawed in several critical ways. The first way was that majorities with the conventional set of understandings would not protect the interests of the powerless, of the minority, of those who could not gain the attention and the support of majorities who were either hostile to them or indifferent to them. And therefore, with respect to certain fundamental rights, the courts had to step in in interpreting the Constitution to protect those rights because you couldn't rely upon democracy to do that. And they understood that from their own history prior to the Constitution. The second reason I think that judicial review is critical to the Constitution um, is that the, the founders of the Constitution understood quite well that in a democracy, majorities, if not constrained, will manipulate the electoral process, as we're now seeing, in order to ensure that they win elections, even if they don't actually have majorities, like by gerrymandering, for example, or by creating obstacles for certain types of people to be able to vote. Um, and again, in that context as well, uh, the court, with the, the framers wanted the court to be able to prevent majorities to do that. So in the, in the, in the situation of abortion, um, I think it's fair to say that what's motivating the anti-abortion movement here is largely religious belief, which is not supposed to dominate our politics in this country. And uh, second, on the part of those people, an indifference to the rights and interests of women. And for those reasons, and that's what the court, I think, understood at the time of Roe, it was essential for the court to step in because it could see that most states were not going to act laws protecting the right to abortion. And <clears throat> that if the court didn't do it, this would not happen. And this, the justices believe, would be a continuing d d disaster for the morals of our country. If a new religion is founded and one of its beliefs is that the fetus is an evil creature that extracts nutrients from the mother's body, so women must abort their children. In that case, like since uh, criminal, although criminal law is of general applicability and it can regulate religious uh, conduct, but since the rulemaking power of anti-abortion laws is now delegated to each state, and in many of the democratic states, it is not a criminal act. Can such religious conduct still be regulated under the law? And would the free exercise clause of the First Amendment have a stronger potency than individual states' rulemaking? So in that case, can women join this religion in order to regain their right to abortions under the free exercise clause? Uh, thank you. I couldn't understand all of it, but I got the last part of it clearly. Um, so the question was, uh, can women regain their right to abortion by claiming that anti-abortion laws discriminate on the basis of religion? And that there's two arguments one could make for that. One is that the laws that are adopted that prohibit abortion in states throughout the country are in fact motivated clearly by religious views. And that the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment prohibits the government from acting in order to establish in the law the religious views of certain parts of the society. The problem with that argument being effective, even putting aside who's on the court, is that it requires the justices to infer what was motivating the legislators. And the court does not like to do that. Um, it doesn't want to be in the business of 
trying to discern whether legislators have racist or sexist or religious views when they pass laws, because doing that would be a nightmare. How do, how do they know that? How do they figure it out, right? Um, and so the court's been very reluctant to do that. Even liberal courts have been reluctant to do that. So even though I do agree that the primary motivating force behind the laws outlawing abortion are grounded in a religious belief and in theory are inconsistent with the Establishment Clause, um, and I suspect people like Jefferson and Madison would have agreed with that clearly, uh, it, for the courts it's very difficult to attribute to the legislators who adopt the law an impermissible motive uh, if the law itself does not expressly do that. Uh, the, the other part of it is the question of whether members of religions uh, who are not opposed to abortion are having their rights violated by a law that prohibits them from exercising their freedom. And that would be an interesting question, even for the current court, if the religion required you to have an abortion and you were now told you couldn't do that. Right? That's the kind of issue this court is very interested in now with respect to Christians. Um, so laws, for example, saying that you cannot discriminate on the basis of uh, sexual orientation to a baker who, won't, who refuses to make a cake, a wedding cake for a gay couple, poses the issue of whether He's being required to speak in a way he doesn't want to, and he's being required to do something against his religion. But in the abortion context, no one's being required to not you know, to have an abortion. And, and the religion, as far as I know, no religion requires you to have an abortion. So you're not being prevented from doing something your religion tells you you have to do. You're only being prohibited from doing something that religion doesn't prohibit. And that would make it much more difficult to make this argument. So I can see making these arguments, especially if the court creates a bunch of precedents protecting Christians in this context. Um, but I, it's a very difficult argument to make for both of the reasons I stated. Um, so I guess you kind of addressed this in that, but I was going to ask if you um, had any concerns that there will be any other constitutional, like, or like Supreme Court changes and like other rights are under um, attack at the basis of this. And then I had another one also, also like outside of voting, like do you think there are ways of creating more systemic change? Because it seems like um, in this case, the system has worked in a way that most people don't agree with. So the mo this is not directly related to Roe, except insofar as it's related to the court's respect for precedent. The court has two cases before it this term on the legality and constitutionality of affirmative action. Up to this point in time, the Supreme Court, with highly contested decisions, has always upheld the legality or constitutionality of affirmative action. And this court, given its makeup, I suspect is likely to overturn those decisions and say that affirmative action by public institutions is unconstitutional and that even affirmative action by private institutions violates federal law. Um, uh, Lee Bollinger, the president of Columbia, and I have just finished writing a book, which will be out hopefully in February, about the issue of affirmative action and the Constitution. Um, and that's another talk I could give, but not here. Um, so I, that's an example of one thing that I think they may, they may do. Um, I think they also will expand the opportunities for death penalty. They will continue to expand the opportunities for billionaires and corporations to spend limitless amounts of money in the political process. Um, and they will not be as protective of criminal defendants as the court has been up to this time. Um, so I think there's a whole lot of issues that are potentially at risk here. Thank you.